So, um, what do you think most people, not most, let me just say it this way, what do you think many people in our country are afraid of? What's something that a lot of people in our country are afraid of? <laughs> Somebody said Hillary Clinton. <laughs> what would you say back there? Islamic State, okay. What else, what else are we afraid of? Economic crash? Persecution? Mm -hmm. Huh? Christians. Many are afraid of Christians, right? Well, this year, um, Chapman University published their third annual um, survey of the, the, the ten most the ten, 10 things that people are most afraid of in America. Now, if you were to, to get a hold of a copy of this survey, you would see that there are a lot more things than just these top 10, but these are the top 10. See if you identify with any of them. Number one, fear. Nearly 61% of uh, Americans cited this one was corruption in the government. Corruption in the government. There we go. Number two, fear. Terrorist attacks, with 41% saying they were afraid of that. Number three fear, not having enough money for the future. With a couple kids in college and a third on the way, I understand that one. Yeah, not having enough money for the future. Number four, being a victim of terror. Personally experiencing a terrorist attack. Number five, government restrictions on firearms and ammunition. Number six, people I love dying. 38.1% said that that was their greatest fear. Number seven, economic or financial collapse. We said that here earlier today. Number eight, identity theft. Maybe you can identify with that one. That's a really bad pun. <laughs> Number nine, people I love becoming seriously ill. I mean, it's a close second to, you know, people I love dying, right? And then the last one, this one kind of surprised me. <laughs> Number 10, <laughs> afraid of Obamacare. <laughs> Go figure, 35.5%. The fear is one of the most prominent emotions that can capture the heart of any person in this room. And in our country today, there are a lot of reasons that people have to be afraid But as a disciple of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, the Bible clearly tells us that we should not be afraid. Let me just list off a few verses. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Now notice that reference. That's Isaiah chapter 41, when God's judgment was coming on the nation of Israel. And that's what he said during that time of judgment. I am the one who helps you. You don't have any reason to be afraid. Then he says in Deuteronomy 31, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, the enemies that they were facing. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid of them, because God is with you, and with, when God is with you, you are in the majority. So he says, don't be afraid. Then in Psalm 27, we read, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of, of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is the one that, that gives us strength. He's the one who, 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 who backs us up and supports us and encourages us. So there's no reason to be afraid, right? The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 29. The fear of man lays a snare. I think that if we were honest, that we would have to say that even though we know we shouldn't be afraid, there are times when we would have to admit that we are afraid. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we still afraid when we know that when God is for us, no one can stand against us? Why are we still afraid? And then to add guilt to our already overwhelming burden of fear, 
we read passages like 2 Timothy 1. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now, isn't that a wonderful sounding verse? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of self-control or a sound mind, another translation puts it. The problem is we are very familiar with this spirit of fear. And the power of love and, and self-control are not always in the picture for us. So why, in the quietness of our own hearts and minds, are we still sometimes afraid? When no one else is around, and I don't have to put a brave face on for someone else, or say the right thing, how is it that my anxiety level can still rise, and a sense of dread can still begin to override me, overtake me, overwhelm me? I think... It's because we have allowed our eyes to refocus from God to our world. And when we look around us, we become rightfully terrified. In the face of impending persecution, Peter wrote a couple of letters to some believers who were scattered throughout the area. Now these were probably Jewish believers and so they understood God's law and they understood what it was like to follow after God. They were away from the temple and they were all by themselves. There's nothing more terrifying than being at home alone, in the dark, in bed, and you hear a noise downstairs. When you are by yourself, it's one thing that really causes us to be afraid. And so these people were scattered all throughout. And, and Peter says in, in chapter 5 and verse 2 of the first letter that he wrote to the, to the, the scattered believers, why he, he gives them the, the reason why he wrote this letter. Now listen to what he says. He says, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. He wrote to them and to us to remind us that we must stand firmly in this world in the midst of God's grace. God's grace, His unmerited favor is what gives us stability. It gives us strength. It gives us courage in the face of whatever enemy comes our way. Whatever onslaught we are facing, we know that God's unmerited favor is on our side. Our God is with us. Turn to the fourth chapter of this same letter of 1 Peter. If you uh, want to use one of the pew Bibles right in front of you, you want to turn to page 852. We'll be looking at, starting in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 4. We're in a series right now, is, is this the end? We look all around us and we see all kinds of things happening, things we never would have imagined. I can't tell you how many people have said to me over the last couple of years, this is not the country I grew up in. And, and, and I've had people say to me, and, and you have probably had folks say this to you, or maybe said them yourself, I never would have imagined that our country would be in the place that it's in right now, a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. I'm sure that's how the believers that Peter wrote this letter to were feeling. They were like, wow, this world is just, I I can't even understand what's going on or how it could get to this place. And so Peter has some advice for us. He has some instruction for us, some things that God wants to put into our lives that he wanted to put in the lives of those first century believers. He says, starts off in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Are we living in the last times? Yes. Yes. They were inaugurated when Jesus rose, when Jesus came to the earth and rose from the dead. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers over a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies 
in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him, <clears throat> excuse me, belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7 sets the tone for this whole section of Scripture. Verses 8 to 11 tell us how we are supposed to relate to each other. He says that we're supposed to love each other earnestly. That means that we go out of our way to show love and compassion to each other. Operation Christmas Child is one of the ways that many churches around the globe do that. But God puts in the heart of every follower of Jesus this desire to serve, this desire to help, this desire to love. In 1 John, he says, how can you say that you love a God you've never seen and not love your brother whom you have seen? It's a mark of a follower to love other people, to love earnestly. But he also tells, them, tells us that we should be happily hospitable. We should gladly share the things that we have, open our homes to one another, be there to support one another and encourage one another. And then he says that we should gladly serve, serve each other with every resource God has entrusted to us. That's what verse 11, 8, 8 to 11 is all about. We're going to focus on verse 7 because unless verse 7 is right, verse 8 to 11 will only be a list of do's and don'ts. What happens is, is God wants to transform the way we think in verse 7 so that verse 8 to 11 happen. God does not give us a list of do's and don'ts and things that he wants us to follow after. What he wants to do is change our hearts so that we become the people he wants us to be, so that we feel the way he feels, so that we think the way he thinks. We're supposed to be people who look at the world the way he looks at the world. So we start, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 7. And verse 7 is, is, is a prayer. It's, it's, it's talking about prayer here. He says, um, the outcomes of a healthy and clear-headed prayer life will be love. It will be hospitality. It will be sharing your resources to build one another up. So he says in verse 7, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers or so that you can pray. He says, be self-controlled, be, be, be calm. Uh, I like the way uh, the J.B. Phillips translation puts it. It just kind of strings the whole thing together and says, be calm, self-controlled people of prayer. We're supposed to be self-controlled and we're supposed to be sober-minded so that we can be people of prayer. To be self-controlled is to be calm, to be self-restrained, to exercise control over one's emotions, to exercise control over one's sensual desires. Now, just to do that in our culture and society would make, you, make us stand up from the crowd. Because nowadays, if somebody feels something, then it's okay. They should do it. They should follow their hearts. I think Disney has lots of great messages and a lot of great truth in their movies. You want to see a really great Disney movie, go see The Queen of Catway. It's, it's just out and it's, it's only showing in one theater, but it is an incredible movie. But Disney has led a generation astray because God does not want us to follow our hearts. He wants us to follow his word. Our hearts are not the source of truth. Truth comes to us from outside us, and our hearts need to be brought into alignment with God's truth. Our feelings don't determine the decisions we should make. God's truth does that. And as God's truth comes into us, he will change the way we feel, he will change the way we think, and he will make us new people who are just like him. We're to be self-controlled, we're to be sober-minded. Since time is short, a disciple needs to be self-controlled, keep our heads about us no matter what, and we are to be sober-minded, that is to be clear-minded, to be sound of, or of, of sound mind. Ten times in the pastoral epistles, Paul admonishes that we are to be sober-minded. The same word is used in Mark chapter 5. 
In Mark chapter 5, you, you have the story of, of a man who was possessed by a demon. And everybody who tried to bind this man and to kind of keep him under control, they would, he would break the chains and he would beat those people. Well, Jesus and his disciples came to this area of Gadara. And as they came to this area, this man who was possessed by demons for many, many years came screaming and hollering, trying to chase these people off, and Jesus stopped him. And the people from the town came out to see what had happened. And when they did, the word sober-minded is how this man was described. They saw him clothed, cleaned up, and in his right mind. God wants us to be in our right minds. I think that's one of the greatest calls for the church today. I mean, some of the wackiest ideas that are floating around out there are coming from people who call themselves followers of Jesus. There are, there are churches out there that, that don't even teach the Bible and don't follow after what the scriptures say. And they come up with really great sounding things that we ought to be doing. But what's behind it all is their heart and not the word of God. So when God's word is what's guiding us and directing us, then we can be clear-headed. We can be clear-headed so that we can pray. So the question is, how are we supposed to be clear-headed? What does it look like for me to be clear-headed? What do I do what are the mental exercises I do to be clear-headed? I was listening on the radio uh, this last week and uh, heard a, a show that I don't normally hear. They had an author on there named Trillia, oh, I can't think of her last name now, a Newbell. And Trillia Newbell said something that really resonated and I think this passage is all about. She said, we spend more time listening to ourselves than speaking to ourselves. Now what in the context she meant was that we need to speak God's truth to ourselves. We need to speak God's word to ourselves, not just listen to what we think. We need to hear what he has to say. In order to not swirl down into despair, I must and you must as well stop listening to our own voices and start listening to the voice of God. His voice has to be heard over every other voice, especially our own. As I was thinking about this passage, I was struck by the words of an old hymn. Now, the hymn writer had in mind what it would be like if, if she were able to go and, and be in the garden with, with God like Adam and Eve who walked in the coolness of the day and they had conversations with God. Listen to what she said. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. She goes to this place to meet with God and in the quietness, she lets God through his Son speak to her and he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Stop right there for a second. What are, all the, what are the messages that you and I have been believing? Have we believed that because we failed a test, we're worthless? Has we believed that because we're vertically challenged, that we're not as good as other people? Have we believed that because we don't drive the right car or live in the right neighborhood or wear the right kind of clothes or have the, 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 the proper amount in our bank accounts that we're worthless? Do we have nothing worthwhile to give, nothing worthwhile to say? We're listening to the lies. If we will walk with him and talk with him, he will tell us we are his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Because God will speak just directly to you. He will work in your life if you will simply let him. One of the things that I, 
often have people ask me is, is how can I communicate with God? What they really want is a, a conversation, just like you and I are talking right now. They want to hear God's voice. And so sometimes we go out of our way and we, and we, we work ourselves up emotionally to try to make sure that we hear God's voice. You know, the song that, we, that uh, Rachel sang for us at the beginning to kind of set our minds towards seeking after the Spirit of God, that song, if it's not empowered by the Word of God, if it's only the nice feelings that we might have, that could take us off in the wrong direction because it's not about a feeling, it's about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's job is to illuminate God's Word to me. It's to help me understand what the Word of God says to me. So here's what happens. There are two words that are used in the, in the Greek for word. One is logos, the other one is rhema. Logos is the written word. Rhema is the spoken word. So here's how conversation with God happens. We get the written word of God into our minds and we speak the written word of God to our hearts, telling our hearts what to believe. And then the Spirit of God, when we go through whatever we're going through, speaks that word back to us. The Logos becomes the rhema so that God is speaking to us and we are having a conversation with God. Now that's not out there weird. That's what it means to have the Holy Spirit live inside of us. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I like this next verse. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing. When was the last time God's word spoke so profoundly to you that the most beautiful bird would stop and listen? Does God's voice speak so clearly to you that the noise of this world is drowned out? Now, I understand you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, Len, that's really nice, but we don't want to base a strong theological truth on the melodious words of, of, a, of a hymn writer, even though they may be based on Scripture. So, let's listen to Elijah's experience. This was Elijah's experience with God. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain and in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And, the, and after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard that voice, that whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? In our entertainment-saturated society, we want the flash. We want the big boom. And God says, you know what? I want to talk to you. I want to have a conversation with you. I want to get to know you. I want you to know me. But I'm not going to come those ways. I'm going to come in the quietness of your time with me. I'm going to come after you pour into my word so that my word can be poured into you and so that I can have a conversation with you. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you recognize his voice? There are a lot of voices competing for our attention. Would you recognize God's voice if he spoke to you? The only way you'll recognize somebody's voice is if you spend time with them. 
I mean, if it's one of my kids on the phone, even if the connection is choppy, I know exactly who it is because I recognize their voice. If I were walking into a, a, a dark cave and I didn't have a light to shine the way for me, but I knew because someone had told me that there was a drop-off not too far into the cave that would, that would drop me down 30 feet and probably kill me, I would gladly keep walking forward if the voice of my wife said to me, Len, stop, sit down, and turn around, and hold yourself by your hands and lower yourself down because there's a ledge that's about six feet down. Now, as you can tell, I'm not six feet tall. So I would have to trust her voice. Do we recognize God's voice? Audiologists tell us that we really can only hear one voice at a time. We really can only hear one voice at a time. If you're watching the Bronco game, listening to the announcer... You really can't hear your wife's voice, gentlemen. Now, that's because you're tuned into the game, you're tuned into the announcer. I remember when Connie and I had been married just a couple of years. We were living down in, in, uh, near Highlands Ranch. And she came home. And it was the fourth quarter. And it was tied. And the Broncos were getting ready to kick a field goal to win the game and in she walked and I will have to confess to you that I did not want her to be home at that time <laughs> because I knew she would want to talk to me and I did not want to talk to her I wanted to watch the game and if I could replay the scene for you it was it was just kind of weird I'm sitting on the couch minding my own business and she comes in, and um, there is a, an ottoman right in front of me. And uh, she's talking to me, and I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But, but I'm doing it very oh, exasperated, probably. And uh, finally, well, she didn't turn the TV off. She moved the ottoman back, sat down in front of me, which blocked my line of sight of the TV and tried to talk to me. And I will confess that I did this. <laughs> that is not an excuse for us, gentlemen. Hey, pastor said I can only listen to one voice at a time and I'm tuned into the TV. No, it's a wake-up call. The wake-up call is this. Are you tuned in to the most important voice in the room? Do we recognize God's voice? When is the last time you hung on every word God was saying? Living as we do in the end times, we must take Paul's words as they were intended. Not a suggestion, but a command. And he told us that we are supposed to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every single thought. Clear-headed prayer comes about when we listen to ourselves less and speak God's word to ourselves more. Oswald Chambers, though he wrote these, these words almost a hundred years ago, spoke prophetically to our times when he said, The battle of prayer is against two things, wandering thoughts and the lack of intimacy with God's character as revealed in his word. Neither can be cured at once, but both can be cured by discipline. I found that on day five of our Pray 31 prayer journal. Um, if you're not already joined with us to, to pray for our nation over the next 31 days, we're about halfway through. There's still some of these prayer guides out in the foyer. You can join us. But it's stuff like that, that that jumps out at me and says, you know what, God has been speaking to his people down through the centuries. And his people have been saying, no, 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 I got something else going on, I don't want to listen. I'm watching the game. I'm tuned in something else. Do 
to cure wandering thoughts, we need to tune into God's Word. We need to focus on what God has to say about a situation, not what everyone else says. And lack of intimacy with God's character as revealed in His Word can only be cured by speaking God's Word to ourselves. By looking at God's Word and letting Him show us what it is we should be feeling and how we should be behaving. We really only have two options. We either listen to our own voice or we listen to God's voice. Jeremiah was a prophet during one of Israel's darkest, most rebellious times. He was so upset in the way that the people of Israel had turned their backs on God and the judgment that was coming because they had turned their backs on God that he even wrote a book called Lamentations. He's called the, the weeping prophet because it broke his heart because God was so dishonored and, and the people of, of Israel, God's own people, were going to be judged because of what was happening. This is what he said in the midst of his despair and his tears. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. This I call to mind and therefore I have hope. This message that he's going to share with us here is throughout the, the entire Old Testament. And he was recalling the truth that he had learned from the scriptures. This I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Hope does not ride on Air Force One. Hope will not ride in your heart because you have a lot of money in the, your bank account. Hope will, will, take, will grow wings and take flight in your heart if you will listen to what God has to say. This I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Think about that. Israel was about to go into exile. Israel was about to be destroyed as a nation. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will have hope in him. How do we behave when times are tough? Would somebody notice a difference in us? If not, it's because we're not speaking God's word to ourselves. And we're not letting the Spirit have that conversation with us. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He had hope, even though judgment was imminent, because he knew God, and he knew God because he knew God's word, and he could call it to mind. The words of yet another preacher from years ago really spoke to a, kind of a, a spear through my heart. Now, this is a guy who famously struggled with depression. He was one of the most gifted speakers, one of the most um, incredibly used men of God who ever stood behind a pulpit, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And this is what he said that really, I think, hits the nail on the head, for me anyway. My fear and anxiety doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. They only empty today of its strengths. Someone sent me a devotional by Max Lucado, and uh, um, he, he addresses kind of this whole topic of the fear that we have in our nation, especially around politics right now. He says this, we are really ready for this presidential election to be over. We're ready for an end to the rancor and tackiness. Voters on both sides feel frustrated, even embarrassed by it all. There is a visceral fear and angst about the result. What if so-and-so wins? When we wake up to November 9th, post-election, when the confetti is swept away and the election is finally over, what will we see? Maybe that thought has struck fear into your hearts. 
Maybe you've been like many who said, you know, we really don't even have a great option. It's not really about party. It's about who can we trust? Whatever your thinking is, I think Lucado has some really great things to say. He says, I have a prediction. I know exactly what November 9 will bring. Another day of God's perfect sovereignty. He will still be in charge. His throne will still be occupied. He will still manage the affairs of the world. And it won't, excuse me, never has his, has his providence depended on a king, president, or ruler. And it won't on November 9th, night, uh, 2016. The Lord can control a king's mind as it controls a river. He can direct it as he pleases, Proverbs 21 one says. It doesn't mean that as disciples of Jesus, we don't do our duty. We don't get out and vote. It's a privilege we still enjoy in this country. Get out and vote. If you're not registered, go online. You can register even today. Make sure that you do that. Um, Lucado ends with this little bit of advice. And if you come to my office, you'll see that I've already followed this advice with big red ink. Circle November 9th on your calendar. Write it, write it upon it, write upon it the words, Our good God rules the world. We can destroy fear by speaking God's truth to ourselves. There's a lot of reasons in this world to be afraid, but if you want to destroy fear, Speak God's word to yourself. So the sermon is ending and my homework is beginning. Here's what I want to offer. You can text me. You can email me. You can leave me a voicemail or give me a call. In the front of your bulletin is my contact information. If you are interested in speaking God's word to yourself, then write send me a text or, or however you want to communicate to me what, what the area of, of fear might be for you and I'll respond with two or three passages that you can let God speak to you to help you gain his mind to help you understand what he wants you to do and help, help you allow the, the Holy Spirit to change your heart and how you're feeling now another way you can com communicate with me is the contact card right in front of you if you write your contact information down, whether it's your phone number or an email, I will be glad to just take that information, write on there one or two words that, that describe the fears that you're struggling with or the things that you want God to speak to you about, and I will get back to you this week. But my hope is that each of us will decide, you know what? We're going to destroy fear. It's going to be eradicated from my life because when God shows up, Fear has to flee. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your truth and thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you're working in each and every one of our lives. I pray, Father, that you would help us during this time of uncertainty and instability to not be afraid, to speak your truth to our hearts and let you shape and mold us and make us the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.